Hello there, friends and neighbors. You're listening to the Disney World Show here on the Movie Squad YouTube channel. I'm Joey DeAngelis, and with me to talk about Beauty and the Beast is Allison Cola. Allison, how are you today? I am doing absolutely magical after watching this trailer for perhaps the 50th time today. Last week, the trailer for the new live-action retelling of Disney's Beauty and the Beast launched and ultimately broke internet records. It received 127 million views over a 24-hour period, breaking Fifty Shades Darker's record. So we're here to talk about the trailer as well as expectations for this live-action movie. And we're going to get the elephant out of the room and start off by talking about The Beast. I like The Beast so far. I, I'm going to admit, when those leaked images came out, I was a little bit... I was a little bit skeptical when I saw how his face looked and how human his face looked. I was a bit put off because I'm just so used to the animated movie. But then um, you and I were discussing a while back when the trailer first came out that he looks almost like a classical monster from paintings of the era, which Beauty and the Beast kind of takes place in like early 1700s. But he looks very much like a classical Renaissance monster. Definitely get that The vibe. design has grown on me. It's grown on me. And seeing his face move and seeing him actually talk and hearing Dan Stevens' voice behind it, I'm sold. I'm buying my ticket in advance. I'm, I'm going to see this movie. <laughs> I remember seeing that first leaked image as well, and sometimes I look at things and I'm like, well, I just need to see how it moves. I looked at that and I said, well, it actually could have been a lot worse looking at that image, but oh, it, yeah. it seemed like they, they got a lot of the, um, the the features. I mean, some people would complain it may look a little too human in the face, but we also have to realize that most of the clips of the scenes we've seen, the beast hasn't been that aggressive. We've seen the beast really beast out or go into beast mode in one scene where he's attacking the wolves and it's that great shot where he's roaring. That's but one of my favorite shots too, definitely. It's a great shot and it really, I think the design is just enough. And they, they, there could have been a point where they may almost could have made it too animalistic. I think it, it works for a live action uh, live action setting plus the way the way he moves and he looks throughout uh, this trailer when he's you know some of the brief scenes where he's dancing and just walking i think it it's perfect just it looks perfect. absolutely fabulous just when he's moving um the ballroom scene is one of my favorites just because let's be honest that's one of my favorite scenes in animation ever and seeing it recreated with these new imaginings of the characters it's just amazing, and I cannot wait to see the full version. I do know I will be an absolute puddle of tears when I see this movie, but I'm going to just embrace it. I'm so excited, but overall, I'm I'm very pleased with what they've done with the Beast so far. The Beast looks good. Now let's talk. Get, let's get on to Gaston and LeFou. We we have brief, very brief glimpses of the, glimpses of those characters. More brief with LeFou, but Gaston, we saw Luke Evans, you know, say, I say we kill the beast. And everyone's like, yeah, and burning things. And uh, we were saying this before. I think Luke Evans is taking a very different approach with his Gaston from the traditional Gaston, where one of the things we loved about Gaston and the original Beauty and the Beast, as played by Richard White, is that he's such an over the top character. He really is. You know, like. It's just, you just listen to that Gaston song, and it's it's perfect. But what Luke Evans seems to be doing, he's, he seems to be a uh, a more possessive type. Um, my, my less only, cartoony? Less cartoony and more like a, like a creep. My What convinced me of this portrayal was his performance in Girl on a Train, where he is a, he is a very, he's very possessive of his, of his wife in that film. And I think to myself... You know what the, the what the vibe I get off of Luke Evans? I can't say I get an over the top like bombastic vibe ever from a Luke Evans performance, but I definitely do get the the you know he you know he's a good looking dude, but he's also kind of the, this guy where he he's after Bell and but it's not just like a cartoony like hey I'm uh, uh, fired by the dogs. <laughs> it's more like yeah dogs. So basically, you're just saying Luke Evans is a general creep and he doesn't have to act. He's a general creep. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> that is what I am saying here. But I think no, I agree with everything you're saying, definitely. But I think you know, I think that goes with more of the the modern retelling of this thing is that in addition we have you know the great Emma Watson in this film. And oh, Emma Watson! I, think I love her. It's taking a a different a different approach. You know, again, I think I like what I've seen with Gaston, but I think we don't have enough to go on off of LeFou, but I think the casting is great. So I think we'll go to Belle at this yes. point. I have heard a lot of people talking about um, positively and negatively. Um, most of the negatives have to do with that. They can't see her as anything but Hermione Granger. And that's a compliment, but it's also unfair to Emma Watson because she is a fantastic actress. I mean, I have, I have seen her in things outside of, outside of the Harry Potter series, although she was the perfect Hermione Granger for those movies. Definitely. It's hard because she, you, you saw her in a, a wallflower, right? With, she was uh, in, oh, you know, Perks of Being a Wallflower. Yeah. And that's and the one. Noah. And those are the only, like, I mean, she's probably, she's done other things, I know that, but she hasn't really done anything on the level of, a like, a big, like, a big movie. You know, yeah. like, a brand name type of movie in a long time. So I can't necessarily blame people, but I just say people have, you know, more of an open mind. But Emma Watson is definitely the ideal choice to play Belle, and I she also, is. and she was actually supposed to be in a Guillermo del Toro adaptation of Beauty and the Beast, separate from Disney. Um, just like a general, you know, adaptation of the classic classic fairy tale. There's also another live action version that came out recently that's getting a Blu-ray release next year. But that's for that's another day and another video. But Belle, I think she she it just the trailer proves that she is the really the perfect choice for this character. I mean, Belle is always near or at the top of like favorite you know favorite Disney princesses, and especially because she is a strong character. It ultimately. Ultimately, she is not the one being saved. She's the one doing the saving. But some people don't recognize Thank this. Thank you. You she's said not, it. Because she's not doing it in a way where it's like the action heroine way where she's like, you know, kicking butt. She's it, it's more, you know, an emotional rescue of, you know, of this of this beast. Of this, it you know, always prince. drives me nuts when people downplay Belle as being like a victim of Stockholm Syndrome. This is a rant for another day, so I'm just going to try and keep this yeah. brief. She's the one who <laughs> – I have gone on rants off the record about how Belle is – about Beauty and the Beast is a misunderstood movie and that they're misdiagnosing it. Belle basically kills the Beast with kindness. Like she kills the Beast's inner anger and his cruelty – with her kindness. She doesn't treat him any different than she treats anyone else. I mean, even in the animated movie, when the Beast is being a jerk and basically holds her against her will, she doesn't let him do it. She's, oh, you want me to come down to dinner? Nice try, Fuzzy. I'm not going. So the other thing I'd like to bring up now are the enchanted objects. I will admit, when I first saw the the images of Cogsworth and Lumiere and the other other residents of the Beast Castle for this new version, I was incredibly skeptical. This was the one. This was a, it was a red flag for me at first because looking at this, I'm like, oh, oh no! And it made me realize how perfect the medium of animation is for fairy tales and such because you just kind of accept it when it's done in the same art style. Like when you see Lumiere and Cogsworth and Mrs. Potts and Chip and all the other characters, you see them just in the same universe as Belle. You accept it, you know. It's it's and it's just perfect. It's perfect, but with live action, they have a they have a different challenge because they got live action Emma Watson, and then you have to do these uh, these objects in such a way where it makes sense for them, you know, makes sense for them to talk. But like, how do they talk in a practical manner? So you have to do you have to do some of these changes. I really like them. I mean, I, like with you, when I saw the still image, I thought the objects were pretty, but I didn't see the characters yet. Like, I, I thought they were very pretty clock and candelabra that I would love to have on my mantelpiece. But when they started moving in the trailer, when I heard them talking, Ewan McGregor is still going to be my favorite guilty pleasure of this movie. His French accent has <laughs> basically remained the same since Moulin Rouge. It's basically like Bert doing his... Uh, <laughs> for oh. doing his British accent from Mary <laughs> Poppins, this is the modern day version of that to me. Oh my goodness! It, it'll it's go so on. it's so it's so over the top, but it's so beautiful. I, I can't wait to hear him sing. Um, 
I love his design. It's so ornate. Same thing with Cogsworth. Um, Cogsworth, he, he's always been one of my unsung favorites just because he's the one trying to keep everybody in line. Yeah. I, I relate to him on a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. And then um, I thought the most interesting design was Mrs. Potts and Schiff, where it's actually the design on the cups that move. Like, it's not that there is actual physical, you know, mouths on them. Right. Um, Like in the Disney version, they look kind of strange with that. But with this design, it actually makes a good deal of sense to where it's like the patterns on them moving. I thought that was clever. Yeah, it's definitely doing something different with these um, with these recognizable characters. With, with these designs, we also get really great voice talent, as, as we were just saying with Ewan McGregor. Yes. Sir Ian McKellen, Al Thompson, of course. We're also going to get Stanley Tucci. I think they're saving him. They're, they're, they know Stanley Tucci is going to break the internet. He's going to break the internet worse <laughs> than anything because he's just that epic. He's, he's, he's the Tooch. Yes. So I think, you know, I've grown, I've grown to like these enchanted objects in this particular version. I think my favorite thing is just how well they blend into the design of the castle. Like, everything feels so cohesive when you transfer from the objects to the castle itself. Yes. Oh, um, God, that castle. The exterior is really interesting to me. It's very different in a lot of ways from the classic um, design. It is. Of the it's not on a mountaintop. That's like. Probably my first big thing that I noticed when it came to the trailer. It's not on a mountaintop. Just in this forest. But it's so gorgeous. And and just like looking at the interiors. The interiors look really just... I I think they look pretty amazing. Uh, One one of my favorite shots in this trailer is the shot... It's like the second, second or third shot... Where it's the beast in the West Wing. In the West Wing. It's a very different take on the West Wing than what we're used to. But I think it, it works, and I just love the shot. Like, the shot, because you just see, like, the, the space, the empty space of the castle, and you see his his loneliness. Why you go, gotta, why you gotta go give me the feels in a trailer? Time? You saw the original film. Everything sort of, you know, transformed into sort of dark and evil with, you know, with gargoyles and all that. Um, it just seems like oh yeah it, with, I remember those. It just seems like with this one, it just seems like the castle just has hasn't been just really hasn't been uh, kept up in years. But it feels like more. The more it just has a more of an abandoned feel. You mean it, exactly? That's the you know, word word I was looking for. More of an abandoned uh, look to it. Like the first teaser trailer where you see like the ballroom, but like everything is like kind of you know dust you know, fading away, all this dust. See the curtains torn. See the candle wax just kind of just melting away. Um, and also probably must you know help with visual effects because, man, can you imagine if they had to like transform the castle as like a CG effect? As cool, as expensive, and probably impossible as that would be, I I would I I, I would appreciate that probably more than the average person would because the original design of the castle is so amazing, but this. I, I have really no complaints about the design of the castle. It's so ornate and elaborate, and you kind of buy that it's enchanted from the look. I, it just looks so gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and don't even get me started about the ballroom. It, my favorite part. The <laughs> library is one of my favorite parts, but the ballroom. Oh, the ballroom looks to great. To see that scene. Yes. It yes. does. It has an odd look to it. Like... I'm trying to think of what the equivalent is that I'm looking for. But well, when I first saw the ballroom in the cheeser trailer, it, it looked, it, I almost thought it was like an outdoor conservatory. Like it has a very open, airy feel. And now that I'm thinking about it, it almost reminds me of the Hogwarts Great Hall where it has that never ending ceiling. Right. Yes. Yes. It mimics yes. the sky. It, 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 that's what it's making me think of. Um, Which is not a complaint at all. The, it sounds, it looks amazing. When you were talking about like it looking different, the one thing I was thinking about was the one shot towards the end of the trailer where you see the beast, you know, beast holding Bell in the ballroom sequence, and you see like the flashing lights and all that. It's oh almost, my god! It's almost, yes, it's almost making me think they're going to try to pull uh, what certain what some classical um, Hollywood musicals do, or even some movies like The Red Shoes, which The Red Shoes really pioneered this, which was. A dance sequence that also tells a story. Um, I could see, like, during, like, you know, obviously, Emma Thompson's probably going to be singing Beauty and the Beast. 
the you know the titular song in that sequence, but I also can see kind of a mini story going on with like weird and strange visuals like in, in the, the movie the red shoes the dance that she does also kind of relates back to her real life so it's kind of it's it's very exaggerated and very you know fantastical and i could almost see that this the way that the shot was i mean it's only like two seconds if that but that was kind of the weird which vibe. i need much more of that yeah <laughs> yes I want more. When you were mentioning the lights coming up, I got a very enchanted feel. And I'm not just saying that as, oh, it feels enchanted. I mean, no, the actual movie, the movie enchanted. Right. Yes, because that whole ballroom scene was based off of the Beauty and the Beast ballroom scene. And that scene was probably my favorite in Enchanted when uh, John McLaughlin is singing so close and there's all the lights and the colors and just the right. costumes and just everything. Except here we only have the two people, which I think is all we need. But it's just a fabulous setup and i can't wait to see the full scene it, it's just shot so gorgeously and if it is telling a story i will watch it a hundred thousand times anyway so another um scene that we kind of have outlined is is the initial scene where maurice uh, goes to the beast's castle you know he goes goes to it's very it's not like the the disney version where he actually enters the castle this one uh, very much makes me think of the 1940s French version of Beauty and yes. the Beast from 1946, directed by Jean Cocteau. I know what you're talking about. It's I've it, seen that one. Where, as the story goes, Belle has a couple sisters, and the sisters, they tell their father what they want, and Belle wants a rose. And that's where the whole rose conceit, you know, the whole, whole thing of the rose com comes into play, and that's how, you know, that that's kind of where that started, in a way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in that version, he picks a rose and then the beast attacks him and makes him his prisoner in that version. And I'd also like to mention that this never gets mentioned enough, but Disney did borrow heavily from that from that Jean Cocteau version, particularly in the use of the enchanted objects where. Oh, the, yeah. The enchanted objects were not necessarily characters in the 1940s version, but they were played by people. For example, there is the fireplace, and there's like statue. There's busts on the fireplace, and they they see and move their heads. And then, if you've seen the the 2004 Fan of the Opera, they borrowed this, where you see arms sticking out of the walls, holding candelabras. And in the, in the cocktail version, that's played out so well, especially with the black wall and the way the lighting is. And then another uh, point about the cocktail version, with this scene going back to what we were trying to get to. Is that there in the beast's garden? There's a you know it's like a statue of a of a deer, and they're the same. This is the same as in this in this new live action version where it's like the the gardens have like these uh, deer statues. Which actually, from what I was reading or, or watching a video a while ago, it was supposed to be because Jean Cocteau, when making the forty six version, wanted the beast designed to be more like a stag, actually. And he wanted to bring up that parallel, but that obviously didn't happen. And the beast in that film was much more yeah. uh, feline. Yes. Yeah, he, he does have a much more of a lion predator look. Um, the gardens are credible and definitely your parallels. Um, we both noticed the parallels to the uh, 40s version of Beauty yes. and the Beast. Um, I do like that they're kind of tributing that original plot point because... Disney made up the idea of the rose being tied to the beast's life force or why it's important. They kind of made that up. Because I don't remember in any other version of Beauty and the Beast where it's explained why the roses are special yeah. besides the Disney version. I mean, right. um, we've made fun of that with some of the lesser Beauty and the Beast films out there. <laughs> you know the one I'm talking about? Oh, the Golden Films. Oh, yeah. I, I've... <laughs> yes. Uh Wow. The, the, if you want to laugh, watch those versions. If you want to cry, watch this trailer. But it's very nice how they're taking this original plot point and kind of working it into this. I thought it was a nice change, but the gardens are absolutely incredible. Just everything inside and outside the castle is beautiful to look at. But my favorite thing with the new design, let's go to the sound design and the music. Oh, my lord every time i hear that opening piano the da 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 da, 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 da. yes yeah. i get a physical chill going up my spine 
and tears are welling to my eyes. And since Joey has watched the original Beauty and the Beast, he can confirm... Well, I say we've watched the original Beauty and the Beast. We've watched it together, and he's seen me cry very heavily. Um, <laughs> it just happens. As with most things. It's one watched. of my favorite things, as with most things. Um, the music... The original score by Alan Menken and the whole the whole music behind the original movie it's it, it's perfect. I can't pick out words to describe it. The problem is this score builds on the original and sounds so much more lush and uh, I want to say epic. Is that a good word to pick it's, for this? Yeah. I mean, we also have to think about the fact that this is a trailer. So they have to, they have to, they have to play it up like that, you know, the big like, da 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 da. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> no, I now just want a, a rock, a rock opera ever just the same. <laughs> you know, um, oddly enough, I would see that rock opera. Well, I guess, um, but you know, it's going to be. It's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to say with, with the score, you know, obviously, you know, with, with um, technology, so recording is a bit different now than it was, you know, back in, you know, 90, 90, 91. So it's going to be nice to have another version of the soundtrack out there. And this is the other, this comes to another point that I, I want to have with, I want to make with this movie is that people are questioning why this thing is getting remade. And it's like, well, in addition to being one of the most famous, like, fairy tales, of all time and one of the most famous Disney animated films of all time. The Di people forget the Disney animated film is just one of the greatest musicals of all time. And for people, because it's no longer running on Broadway anymore. I mean, there's probably touring companies and all that. There are tours. There are tours, but this is a chance for people to, you know, to see this, um, to see this great, you know, movie musical on the big screen. You know, with with new actors and a new recording of the of the of the songs that you love, so that's how else I will defend this movie. Is that just think of, it's also it, it's it's serving a triple purpose: another adaptation of the classic story, another it's a new adaptation of the animated film done in live action, but also it's a an, an adaptation of the the iconic music. I couldn't have said it any better. You defend this movie like that. I will defend it with a sword if I have to, because Beauty and the Beast is one of my all-time favorites. And when I heard it, it was getting a live-action remake, I was very excited. And just just to go into my predictions for this, I, I think it's going to be great. Just every tidbit I hear and everything I see is pointing me in a good direction. It's the same feeling I got with Star Wars The Force Awakens last year. I followed every trailer... Um, I watched all the discussions and I went in with very high expectations. I, I admit there, the movie had its own set of issues, but on the whole, it was an amazing time at the theater. And I, I basically feel the same way about this. I'm just, I'm just so excited. I feel like a kid again watching this movie it's going to be interesting to see the the critical and audience reaction to this movie um as we get clo closer to the release and once it really gets released in march because you know this is such a as you said we we both love the original film but there are also people who love the original film that are not necessarily thrilled with the trailers so i want to I, I was i'm very curious to hear their thoughts once the movie comes out but i think in conclusion i think we are very both of us are very pleased with what we've seen so far from these from these two trailers. I really don't have any issues with this trailer, do you? In terms of major things, n no. It, the, no. Nothing really sticks out to me as like ter like truly terrible. I mean, so I was, I enjoy it every time I watch it and I still can't wait for the movie, but I can see possible problems like, you know, you know st sticking too closely to the source material. But again, this is a big live action remake. It's not going to be an 85 minute animated film, you know, like jungle book. The original was like 80 minutes, not even 80 minutes long. And this, the new one is like a hundred minutes. So they're definitely going to add things to, to make it, um, to give it more depth and all that. But on the whole yeah. trailer looks, I think it looks great. Um, I love every time I watch it and I'm looking forward to seeing it on the big screen. So, folks, thank you for listening to this installment of Disney Worlds. I have an Avatar 
land video recorded, but I'll upload that probably uh, within, ne- within the next day or so. In the meantime, you can check out our reviews of the Kong Skull Island trailer from Inside the Man Cave, as well as Richard and Andrew's thoughts on Suicide Squad, the extended cut. And Allison, you're supposed to be on a uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them discussion video sometime in the future, aren't you? Sure are. Be on the lookout for the Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them video. And coming up in the next couple of days, we will have a Moana discussion video. That's right. To welcome the newest Disney princess into the Disney family. Out of the two of us who have seen it, I will say, spoiler alert, I loved it. Joey, what did we talk about when it came to spoilers? Uh... You know, I'm just going to, um, next time you ask me, like, what'd you think of this movie? It happened. It was an hour and a half, and it had people. Well, Joey, thank you for letting me on to the Disney World's, the very first Disney World's movie discussion video. I hope to be doing much more of these in the future. Yes, I hope to, do, to be doing the same as well with you, and hopefully other, we'll get other people on the on this program as well. Anyway, folks about our time to sign off. Peace.